morning, church. I want to welcome you on this beautiful, beautiful day as we celebrate the promises of God. I'm Jim Wood. I love Jesus as my Savior, and I want to welcome you to our family, whether you are with us in person or you are with us virtually. We are together in the Lord. I want to ask you to do one thing before I do the call to worship. Get your Bibles and find uh, two passages for me. The first is Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is very easy to find. It's between Psalm 50 and 52, so that's easy. And then in the New Testament, find Philippians. I always learned it this way. Catholic girls eat popcorn. So you got Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. There you go, and then Colossians. So it's right in there in the New Testament. So if you find Psalm 51 and Philippians, the first chapter, that's great. Our call to worship this morning comes from the psalmist. Open my lips, Lord and my mouth will declare your praise. Let us worship our God. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer as we confess our sins to our loving and faithful God. You'll find the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. O oh God of forgiveness, we pray for new life as we confess our old ways. We hear of your promise amid our own sense of self-doubt. Hope is proclaimed, yet we seek guarantees. Christ calls us to obedience, but we set conditions. When called on to follow, we ask to what end. We applaud commitment, but we treasure our comfort. Forgive our reluctance to walk in newness of life. Sisters and brothers, 
The Lord's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. few announcements for you this morning. The first one is, uh, it is a joy for us to be together in worship this morning, and it is a joy for us to connect with one another and be in prayer. So with that, I invite you to fill out your connection card. There's a place for you to share your prayers with us. If you'd like them confidential, just check that box and only our pastors will see it. Otherwise, our elders, our deacons, and our prayer teams will pray over those cards. For those of you worshiping online, you can click the link above the window where you're watching that says connection card and complete the card there. And new this week, we've added a connection card to our sermon archive. Um, we are a church that worships on Sunday morning, but also throughout the week, anytime and anywhere. So if you're worshiping later in the week, please take a moment to click that button that says, let us know you worship with us. And with that, I'd like to give a shout out, a hello to uh, my friends, Chris and Sue in New Zealand who will be worshiping later in the week because right now it's 2.30 on Monday morning. Um, so, so they'll catch up with us. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite Cheryl Wood, my good friend, to come up and give us an announcement about the 24 hours of prayer. Sure. Thanks, You're welcome. Are you ready again? For those of you who don't know me, I am Cheryl Wood, and I am the wife of Jim Wood. And for 22 years, we have loved being a part of this congregation. It's just, just been absolutely amazing. And our congregation has done so many wonderful things. You're a part of this congregation. You know that. We go on mission trips. We help around here. We do the soup kitchen. We're trying to be there in so many ways. And so many of you I see out there just take part of just being, of giving totally of yourself. One more way I would like to ask this congregation to come together, which we've done for a good many years now, is praying for 24 hours. God loves our prayers. And if you think that this doesn't work, if prayer doesn't work, I would encourage you to pray to God to help my unbelief. It's a time that we can grow together. It's a time that we can put a stronger foundation as we go into the new year. So what I'd like you to do is I would like you to go out to the welcome desk and you can find 24 hours of prayer pamphlet there that you can pray through. Also, if you would like to, go online to fpcnorfolk.org and you'll be able to sign up there. Now, if you're anything like me with computers, you might have trouble signing up. So please feel free. I did figure out how to do it, so please feel free if you would like to to um, give me a call or to email me at CherylFBCNorfolk.org and I'm S-H-E-R-Y-L and I'll be more than happy to talk you through it and make sure that you do get registered. So who we're going to begin is next um, Saturday at 8 o'clock. We're going to pray from 8 o'clock Saturday morning until 8 o'clock Sunday morning. And then we'll all join together in our new time with, um, as we begin our new season this year and just celebrate our time together in prayer. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. What a wonderful way to launch our new uh, service times by praying for 24 hours to lead into that. Um, we also have an opportunity this morning. We're called to be in prayer um, not just then, but uh, throughout our, our day. And as we turn to a time of prayer this morning, um, we have several things that we want to specifically lift up in prayer uh, together. We lift up prayers for world peace and reconciliation in our nation. 
Certainly prayers for those recovering from hurricanes in various parts of the nation, from flooding and the aftermath of those storms. Prayers for the nation of Afghanistan uh, as the unrest continues and the, the drawdown moves forward. It's a season of new beginnings for many of us, a new school year, and college students are headed off and kids are headed back this week. Um, so we pray for a fresh start, a new beginning, and all the hope and promise of a new school year. And with that, we have a prayer of praise for our preschool. We lift up the 162 preschoolers that will be joining us this week and the more than 60 staff as they um, journey back on Tuesday morning, right, um, for a fresh start in a new year. Uh, prayers for our community. We have a blood drive this week on Thursday from noon to 6. Um, prayers for those who will donate and for those who will receive a blessing through that outreach. We continue to lift up prayers for healing and recovery for Silas Wood and for Chris McKinnon Hing. This past week, uh, throughout the week, we received 150 prayer requests through our connection cards, requests for friends and family, for health and healing, um, for new starts to the school year, and for travel. Let us go before the throne of grace and mercy in prayer. Gracious Lord, we come before you this morning with hearts set on worship for your holy name. Lord, we ask that your hand of guidance and discernment and provision, your hand of healing and wholeness be upon us, our family, our city, our nation, and the world. Lord, we ask that in this time when we might be confused, when we find ourselves facing unbelief and doubt, that we lean not on our understanding, but on your eternal and holy and perfect wisdom. Lord, we come together before you this morning as a community with the power of prayer as we, as we join together and as we join our voices together as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Hunter, and I work with our little people um, in the preschool and the church. And we are so excited to be starting a new preschool year on Tuesday morning at 7.30. We'll be greeting um, our all-day families, and then at 9 o'clock we'll have our half-day families. So it's a fun, fun day uh, to have all of our little biddies back in the building. So if you're a grown adult, you might think that you have 16 more days of summer until September 22nd when fall comes, and it's appropriate to um, buy a pumpkin spice latte at that point. Um, I work with two people who have already decorated the preschool office for um, the fall season, and it, it goes against every bit of what is um, appropriate to do that in August. But So you might think that you have 16 more days, but if you are a kid, you know that today is your last Sunday of the summer. And when I was a kid, and I was Jesse and Jonah's age, and Eli's age, and all these other kids, uh, it was not a summer for me until my mom and dad drove me all the way to Williamsburg to go to Bush Gardens. And I'm 44 years old now, and in all of my 44 years of living, I don't ever remember a time when you got out of that tunnel and there wasn't construction happening between the tunnel and Bush Gardens. And what should have been a 45 minute trip that always inevitably turns into something that feels like you're driving to Charlottesville. I'm 44 years old and I'm married to a man that does construction on roads for a living and I still don't understand it. And it makes me think about what Jim is going to talk about today in Philippians. And so I want to read the scripture, Philippians 2.6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. So I started thinking about me and my life as a Christian and I started thinking of myself that I'm kind of like Interstate 64 between the tunnel and Bush Gardens. 
and how it's like God works on me a little bit here, and you think he's done, but he's not done because he's got to move on to the next mile marker and a little bit more here, and it just feels like he's always working on me, and it's been 44 years, and there's always construction happening on Interstate 64 to get to Bush Gardens for that one most awesome day of summer. Um, and so I started thinking about that, and it's like the Golden Gate Bridge. I read a fact one time when I was a kid when I was taken out to um, San Francisco to visit my family, and I heard that somebody is always painting the Golden Gate Bridge because once they get from one end and get to the other end, it's taken so long that they have to start again. So that's us as Christians. He's constantly working on us, and we're a constant work in progress, and that's okay. Um, so that's what Jim's going to be talking about today. And in the children's ministry, in children's church, we're going to be talking about the Old Testament and how so many of you, well, you normally would go back to school on Tuesday, but you're not if you're in public school because it's a holiday. And I'm sure the parents are thrilled about that, but it is a Jewish holiday called Rosh Hashanah, and it is the Jewish New Year that Jesus would have celebrated. So we're going to learn all about that today and why... Um, Folks eat apples and honey for the sweetness of a new year and the uh, healing properties that apples give. So we're going to hit the Old Testament and the New Testament today. So kiddos, join us in Children's Church at 10 o'clock. So this is the very last day. We're going to see you at 8.30. Next week, I'm so excited. Our 8.30 service is moving to 8. Our contemporary service is moving to 10, which means that we have the power hour for all of our best children. 10, 10, 10 what? Contemporary is moving to nine. Come on, y'all aren't going to go to it anyhow, please. Let's, let's get real. Every one of y'all is going to the contemporary service. Um, um, so 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock is moving to 9 o'clock for the contemporary, and then 10 o'clock is when we are having Sunday school hour for grown-ups, kids of all ages, and then for those of you that have been waiting patiently, the 11 o'clock service is back next Sunday. So I'm going to close this in prayer, and we will see you next week as we start a wonderful new season in the life of our church family. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the privilege that we have to be a church family. And we are so excited, Lord, for the sweetness of a new year in our church family and in school and in all of those wonderful places of life, Lord, that you have blessed us. We pray that we will be uh, walking alongside of you, and we are privileged to know that we are your work in progress. In your heavenly name, amen. Good stuff, good stuff. Okay, just a reminder, next Sunday... Not 8.30, 8 here, okay? Then 9 o'clock contemporary. 10 o'clock is our community hour where we'll have Sunday schools, uh, classes for adults and for children. Um, Sandy Mandrick probably has wrangled you already for her Sunday school class, but if you have not, uh, if you are interested, uh, uh, George Pratt and I, uh, George is a psychologist, a professor, uh, and a director, uh, he and I are going to do a three-week class on this great book I, I read this summer. I've probably read it six times. I'm not exaggerating. Called Chatter, the Voice in Our Head and Why It Matters and How to Harness It. So it's a kind of a neat, neat book about uh, why, what's going on in there. And uh, so we're going to do a three-week class. That's going to be on Sunday morning at 10. In addition to our other Sunday school classes, and uh, then 11 o'clock, uh, we're back here in the sanctuary for traditional worship. So good, good things happening. Okay, I want to do it backwards today. So Philippians chapter 1, and then we're going to go to Psalm 51. And if you're at Philippians chapter 1, go to verse 3. I'm going to read two verses. <clears throat> I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Now, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is uh, one, of the, one of the more famous of the 73 psalms that David wrote out of 150. And if you are there at it now, you'll see that the, the caption is, is important to the interpretation. It says, for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Now, here's the story, right? It's, not just adultery. David actually had Bathsheba's husband killed, so he's a murderer. And the prophet Nathan comes to David and um, tells David a story. <clears throat> tells David a story about uh, a, uh, a rich man 
who had flocks and flocks and flocks of sheep, and a poor man who had one little lamb. And the little lamb he loved and tended and cared for. The rich man invited another rich man into his house for a meal. And rather than going and slaughtering and offering one of the hundreds, if not thousands, of lambs that he had, he went and stole the poor man's lamb, slaughtered it, and used it for a dinner for a guest. As soon as Nathan tells this story to David, David becomes enraged. David says, the man should be killed. He should have four times the payment and the penalty for what he's done wrapped upon his head. And then come the famous lines from Nathan, you are the man. David immediately recognizes and realizes what it is that Nathan is saying to him. Now imagine that happening. What's the first thing you think David would do? Well, the first thing David does is he prays. And this is his prayer, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful at the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You don't delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I just want to stop crying. I'm tired. Those are the words of a woman as a reporter came and front of her house, or what used to be her house, while she was standing in hip deep water, put a microphone in front of her and asked her how she felt about having everything that she owned destroyed in the hurricane. I just want to stop crying. I'm tired. If I had a different theology, I'd look at the world today in fact, even with my theology, I look at the world today and wonder what the signs are for us as a people. Think of what's happening. Hurricanes, floods, scores of people dying, bars across the country that have a reserve table in the middle with 13 drinks. to recognize 13 of our children who gave the ultimate sacrifice in Afghanistan in one bombing. And then we start to think about all the things we don't know, 
all the places in the world where the reporters don't come and put a microphone in front of your face. Ah, oh, I just want to stop crying. I'm tired. So here's the question. What happens when what you want to happen doesn't happen? What happens when what you want to happen doesn't happen? And here's the answer. We just pray. We pray. Turn to our God. And just pray. And sadly, too often, that statement stays true. Sadly, we just pray. It's too easy to pray short. And here's what I mean by that. I had the weirdest experience, I don't know, 10 years ago, with a group of uh, colleagues, actually friends in ministry. We were on a retreat together. And it came time to pray. So these are all pastors, right? <clears throat> it came time to pray. And, um, and when we collected our prayers and all, and you know, all of that, and we're all getting in the pastor's you know, religiosity kind of thing. And, that we're bowing our heads and we're getting ready to pray. And, and the person that began the prayer began this way. Said, Lord Jesus, we just want to. And as soon as he said that, someone in the group said, stop it. So, whoa. And everybody looked like, what happened? He said, let's be clear here. If you're going to pray that, you better mean it. Father, Jesus, God, we just want to. He says, what is this just want to? You only got one thing to say? Is it, is it we just want to thank you? We just want to praise you? We just want to ask you? Is it just one thing? If it's just one thing, then it better be a short prayer. Why do we start that way, he says. And of course, we're all sitting there like, whoa. And we're also sitting there like, wow. I've never forgotten it. I still pray that way sometimes and I catch myself like, oh Lord, I hope nobody's going to yell at me. But Jesus, we just want to say, we just want to pray. You see, too often we pray short. Too often we, 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 we miss the power of prayer because we simply hold up the, the immediate, the pressing, the people we know, the and see, that's the beauty of the Psalter. 150 of these prayers, songs, prayers set to song. Makes them easy to memorize, by the way. And, and, and out of those 150, 73 that are attributed to David, this murderer that we just read, one of his prayers. It, it, it's, it's the beauty of the Psalter because what I find in, in, in the Psalms is that there's a praise in the dark. Every emotion, every thought, every feeling is found in these 150 poems. I mean, everything you can imagine, from celebration to, to overwhelming need to wanting to have your, your enemies just completely destroyed, even their children. I mean, all these emotions are found in their raw and their real and their here. And when I come to Psalm 51, David doesn't pray a just prayer. He doesn't say, I just want. He prays to begin with, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Have mercy on me. He's not bargaining. He's not hedging. He's not negotiating. He's simply saying, have mercy. Later, he says, create in me a clean heart. Don't cast me away from you. Renew a right spirit within me. There's this prayer in the midst of being found out by Nathan, who he knows that Nathan knows because God knows and God told Nathan when he should be running as we would think in the world, hiding or he should be avoiding. The first thing he does is he cries out to his God, not a just Lord do this but he places his whole life and heart before him. 
And this praise in the dark is what I would call pure intimacy with God. Um, you remember the story about Job? So, if you don't know about Job, just Google it later. But, but, but here, here's Job. So, Job has a, a competition between Satan and, and God. And, uh, and God lets uh, Satan do whatever he wants to Job, except he can't take his life. So, here's what happens. A messenger comes to Job. This is all in the first chapter. A messenger comes to Job and says, uh, hey, your oxen that are plowing and your donkeys uh, have been stolen. Oh, and by the way, um, all the servants that were with them have been killed. Another messenger comes and says, a fire burned up your sheep. And by the way, your servants, they were burned up and died too. Another messenger, and these are just in verses, right? I mean, this is not a long story. This is exactly what happens. Another messenger comes and says, oh, your camels, they made off. And the people that took them, oh, they killed your servants as well. Yet another messenger comes and says, your sons and daughters, they were at a party in, in one of their houses. A mighty wind swept in, struck the four corners of the house, and they were all dead. So your oxen, your donkeys, your sheep, your camels, all your servants, and all your children. At this, Job got up tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Praise in the dark. This overwhelming intimacy with God. And Jesus in, in, um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus starts giving some really hard teaching. And uh, as he starts to give the really hard teaching, like the stuff that we still try to avoid in church, um, he, um, <laughs> he, he starts to lose a bunch of disciples. People just start leaving in flocks. I mean, the thousands that were with him are now in hundreds and maybe scores, and you know, they just keep falling away. And so Jesus looks at the 12. This is in the sixth chapter of John. He looks at the 12 and he says, do you want to leave too? Do you want to leave too? And Peter looks at him and he says, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Perhaps the most authentic first line of any prayer we could ever offer is, I've got nowhere else to go. And perhaps the time we mean it the most is when it seems to be the darkest. I got nowhere else to go. But even then, don't pray short. See and claim the goodness of God. That's the power of Job. I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a child. To lose all my children. I can't imagine how overwhelming and painful. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine. And yet he says. Naked I came, naked I'll depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Paul, you know, he's, he's writing in Philippians. You know Philippians is like my absolute favorite letter of Paul's. Until I read another one, but I really always come back to Philippians. And, uh, <clears throat> and you know this, right? Because if you've been around me, you've heard me say this scores and scores of times. So Paul's writing Philippians while he's in prison. Most likely he's in Rome. Uh, he doesn't say, but most likely he's in Rome, which is where he's going to die, where he's going to be executed. He's, um, he's, he's in prison, and when you start to read, and you read a few verses later in the first and, and into the second chapter, you realize that he's overwhelmingly depressed and he doesn't want to be alive. Some people even think that he's contemplating suicide. You can kind of see that in this. He's overwhelmed. He, has, he, 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 he doesn't want to be alive. And yet, he says, to the people he's writing to, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Later in Philippians, he says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. But in all of that, the Lord strengthens me. 
There's something about this call of the disciple, Paul, to be filled with this overwhelming joy in the midst of the worst that the world can bring to him. And what Paul does for us, what Job does for us, what David does for us, is it reminds us that when we are surrounded by darkness, we pray the sunrise. When we're surrounded by the darkest things, we pray the new day, the new light, the new world. Um, in your email, you have a, your Saturday email, I think, um, if not your Sunday. There's a prayer, it's also on our website, um, written by uh, Nicole Del Favero. So Nicole and Michael and their infant daughter, Georgia, are dear, dear parts of our life and family. Um, Michael um, was a Marine, and Nicole, as the wife of a Marine, the spouse of a Marine, knows certainly all the many doubts and fears and worries that come when your spouse leaves and the prayers that they come back. And she offered this prayer. I'm just going to read a portion of this prayer. It starts out, Dear Lord, it feels so hard to find the words to express the sadness and grief felt. The grief can feel consuming. Worry is overbearing. I come to you, Lord, filled with heaviness. And then she lists all these many things for which she offers prayers. And she concludes it with this. Lastly, Lord, I pray for our two nations and our world. I pray for kindness, compassion, and understanding. I pray for the light in each of us to outshine the darkness of these days as we continue to move through a world that looks vastly different from the one we left behind yesterday. Amen. I pray for the light in each of us to outshine the darkness of these days. And I think what a powerful prayer. Because that's the ultimate hope of the world. You know, what is prayer? Prayer is believing what Jesus says in Matthew and in Mark. If you see a mountain and you believe you have faith and believe, you can say to that mountain, move. And it'll move. That's what prayer is. Not just to help me get through now. Not just to, to guard me and protect me in this moment, as important as that is. But how often we fall and pray too short. Instead of truly believing that this prayer life, that this prayer, that this opportunity to be in relationship with our God is what brings full transformation to this world. That's the power. In uh, 1910, uh, a year after Teddy Roosevelt last served as president, um, well, he went, he went to, uh, to East Africa for a year to hunt, <laughs> do the Teddy stuff, and then he started a tour where he came back through Europe and uh, in 2010, I mean 1910, he was invited to speak at the Sorbonne in Paris. Huge crowd gathered, you know, big personality, big name. And he gave what has become known as his absolute most famous uh, speech. We call it the man in the arena. It was actually a speech entitled The Citizen of the Republic. But here's the part that we remember the most. It's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory 
nor defeat. I have said these words so many times in my life, over my life, over my children, over issues, over concerns, over and over and over. If he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. What if we prayed this way? What if we truly believed that the mountain would move? What if we spoke to mountains more? What if we didn't pray short only for me and mine? As important as that is, what if we held up the power of prayer? What happens? What happens when we don't get what we want, what we think we should have? What happens when we wake up and see a world that's changed? What happens when we worry for the generations that come dealing with the stuff that we are leaving. What happens? Well, we as the followers of Christ enter the arena. Our heads bloody but unbowed, and we pray not to hide, not to try to make it through for ourselves, not in fear or worry and doubt, but in joy, because we know the promises of God. And we know that he calls us to claim that joy and those promises in the midst of the darkness, to pray the sunrise, not just for us, but for this world, not just for those that we know, but for those who are unknown to all, but but just God. That's who we are. And if we fail, let us fail while praying greatly so that our place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat nor the word of their God. David prays. He lives with the consequences. His children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren live with the consequences. But God uses him. God allows him not only to survive, but he makes him part of the eternal plan of the kingdom of God. And so it is with us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. We don't bring a just. We thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for the sunrise. We thank you especially for the promise of a sunrise in the darkness that we know. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the sun raised in our hearts and midst. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you came and breathed the breath of life upon us and upon this world. And from that very moment of creation, you have been calling us and breathing within us the promise to hold us. And we come before you this morning as a people who, if we fail, we will fail daring greatly in our prayer so that we will never be placed with the cold and timid souls. And we come to you today and we say to the mountains of oppression, and fear, and worry, and separation, and anxiety, and doubt. We say, move. Not just keep us safe, but move. And Lord, we pray it, and we wait for you to do it. And if that doesn't bring joy, we are already dead. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, let us respond to God's faithfulness by giving our tithes, our gifts, and additional offerings. There's a number of ways that we can do this. For those of you worshiping in person, uh, you can place your offering in the envelopes in the pew back and place them in the baskets. This is new this week, a new procedure. Um, You can then take those baskets and pass them to the outside of the aisle where ushers can then collect them. 
Um, please also place your connection cards in that basket as well. For those of you worshiping online, you can click the button above where you're watching that says give online, or you can give through the connection card. And for everybody, you can text to give if you prefer to do so. That number is 757-530-5683. You can text the word give to that number and complete your offering that way. Let us continue to worship our Lord.
Almighty God, accept these blessings and of our gifts and offerings and use them for mighty ways in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing as we continue to worship. that we are doing our 24 hours of prayer and I want to encourage you to please, please, please be a part of it. And um, we've done this twice now in the midst of this pandemic. And um, last year we had 24 hours of prayer and we still had the pandemic. But think of what it would have been if we hadn't prayed for 24 hours. Uh, I mean that. See, I think this is the great challenge that we as Christians have. We, we sell our God short. We, we measure based on what we think and want. We choose to create God in our image, not be created in God's image. And we set the parameters for what we choose. Prayer's not that. Prayer cries out, have mercy on me. Prayer cries out, create in me a clean heart. Prayer cries out, renew a right spirit within me. Prayer cries out, mountain, move. I have a, one of my dearest friends, a member of our congregation. She told me that she prayed every single day that her son would come back to church. She died in her late 80s, and her son never came back. Within six months after he died, he showed up one Sunday, and he hasn't missed in more than 10 years. Don't stop praying. Your timeline is irrelevant. Pray to the eternal God who can make and does make all things well, and pray joy even as you ask for mercy and the mountains 
will move. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.